Bishop, welcome. Dear friends, we welcome Bishop Andrew with us this morning. I want to invite the children to go with Mother Wendy into the lobby area for Children's Church. And Bishop, uh, welcome. We're so delighted you're here. If you've not had the opportunity yet, if you're if you're recently arrived, as we all are, and if you've more recently arrived and you've not had the opportunity yet to meet our bishop, uh, look forward to that treat of meeting him following the service. And Bishop, we're so glad that oh, you I'm thrilled. are. So good to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So you, you may not recognize me, but oh, now you recognize me, don't you? Now, now we know who you are. <laughs> thank you. Can I pray for you? Oh, I'd love you yeah. to. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, we do thank you for Bishop Andrew, and we pray, Lord, pour out your spirit on him now. Bless him. Give him yourself. Feed us in your name, Lord. Amen. 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 Do have a seat. It is so very, very good to be here. This is so exciting. What a beautiful thing God is doing. Um, I'm going to come to, I'm going to preach from um, Ruth, and I'm going to tell you why in a moment, but I, I am loving your new livery. You, it's, you, it's looking very, very nice. <clears throat> and of course, this is Trinity Sunday. Can you see this here that I'm pointing to? Is this, is this out of your sight? Because I, I was looking for a, if you can see this, it'll be helpful. So here's the beautiful thing about the Trinity. So we've got here, let's say, in, in no order of preference, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, okay? Where, where is your place on that? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, where are you? I, I want you to remember this. Whenever you look at your insignia, I want you to remember this. Where is your place on that map? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Through Jesus' work on the cross, you are there, right there, right held in the heart of God. And as absurd as it would be to imagine that Jesus would somehow be kind of thrown out of the Godhead. It's like, oh, no, actually, we're kind of bored of your teaching, so off you go. Or we don't need the Spirit anymore. Or oh, we're, not so, we're not so interested in the Father. It, 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 as absurd as that would be, how could that possibly ever happen? Of course, it's never going to happen. So absurd is it that you would lose your place that Jesus has made for you by his work on the cross right at the heart of God. Amen? Amen. So when you come into church, however you're feeling, whatever day it is, where am I? Right there. Right there, Trinity Sunday, and every Sunday, and every day, right there. Amen? Amen. And I feel, I feel this incredible kind of celebration in God's heart over you, that the heart of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, ooh, hang on, you never know with these things whether they're... I just look before that. It's not that I'm especially tall, it's just that my eyesight is going, so that's fine. <laughs> I'm good, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good, I'm good. So I came, I came to preach, and I, I was all kind of set to Trinity Sunday to do a kind of Trinity thing. And this is, this is a Trinity thing. But I, what it was in my heart was, no, there's this celebration of love over you. I, I feel this profound sense of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit celebrating in love over you. And I think it was my job to bring that, that sense of God's heart celebration over you this morning. So Ruth, in particular chapter 4. In by saying, have you ever noticed um, how many epic love stories are set in the context of the Empire State Building? There are many. Just a couple. I mean, there is this King Kong. Um, come on. <laughs> Who can remember him clutching the girl of his dreams in one hand and biting airplanes with the other? You know, I mean, there, there's Sleepless in Seattle, Meg Ryan. I saw Sleepless in Seattle with my wife in when it was in the cinema in a, in a movie plex place in Cape Cod in what, 19, do we want to say? Anyway, <laughs> in New England. We were on vacation in New England from England. Anyway, uh, and then, you will remember this, I'm sure, because you are a cultured kind of people, but the 1957 classic, An Affair to Remember, with Cary Grant. Oh, of course, there I knew, you see, <laughs> Cary Grant who was English, by the way, just saying. Um, and, uh, and Deborah Kerr, the American Film Institute, described this as the most romantic film of all time, or one of the most romantic films of all time. So, if you don't know the movie, just real quick, the SS Constitution is making its way from uh, London to New York. Uh, Cary Grant and Deborah Kerr are both their characters are engaged to someone else. They kind of seem to have fallen into that. But it's clear that they, they have these chance meetings and soon romance blossoms. 
And, and although they try and walk away, they can't, and they come to this arrangement that they will meet again in six months' time in the Empire State Building um, if they have, you know, put down the, the other relationships they were in and, and got new jobs and there's a whole new life. If they manage to do that, they will meet six months later in the Empire, at the top of the Empire State Building. Uh, so six months passes, and of course, they, they both are successful in kind of ending those relationships and, and, and come to the Empire State Building ready to meet each other. And Deborah Kurt, fortunately hit by a yellow cab at the foot. I mean, have to suspend belief there, whatever, how would that happen in New York? But anyway, she's hit by a yellow cab. Uh, so Cary Grant is up there, and he waits till midnight, you know, and he just presumes that she d d d he doesn't love him, and it's all over. So it's, it's very sad. And then they kind of meet up a few times. Unfortunately, the accident means that Deborah Kerr can't wa walk anymore. So they have these really awkward meetings where he's wondering why she won't stand up, and he doesn't, she doesn't want to say why she can't stand up because she doesn't want him to feel that he, she, he has to marry her and he thinks that she's rejected him. And this just goes on and on and on through the whole film. It's enormously frustrating. And as a kid, if you're watching this film, really annoying. He's like, I would just say something, somebody, <laughs> right? And then there's this final, final scene, if you remember it. And it all looks like love's labors are all lost. It's like, oh my gosh, this is the moment. For goodness sake, somebody say something. Nobody does. She's still sitting. He's still wondering why she's not standing up. He's about to go out the door, it's all over. And then he spots, I think it's a walking cane or something, is it? It gives it away, and oh my gosh, the big moment. Praise God, everything's clarified. They clearly still love each other. Hooray, the happy ending. And that is what you've got at chapter four with Ruth and Boaz. That's my point. <laughs> That's my point. That is, uh, thank you very much. There's a round of applause there. Thank you. That is what you've got. It's just when you thought that all hope was lost, just when you thought it was all over and they were going to lose each other forever, true love conquers all. True love conquers all. They, they get at the city gate. It was seen that, that it, it's all over. And then there's this beautiful kind of unexpected reprieve. Just at the moment, it looks like he's handed Ruth's hand in marriage to somebody else. And they said yes. It's like, oh my gosh, it's all over. And then there's this kind of wonderful kind of reprieve, and the guy gets the girl, and this great big happy ending. The whole book of Ruth is this epic love story. There's Naomi's grief over losing the love of her life. That's um, Ruth's um, mother-in-law. There's Ruth's love for Naomi, which is wonderful and loyal and committed. There's Naomi's love for Ruth, equally loyal and committed. And then, of course, there's Boaz's love for Ruth and Ruth's love for Boaz. Uh, and all of this, all of this is related to us so that we might fully encounter, comprehend, and receive the biggest love of all, which is God's love for us. This big moment of reprise, this big moment of ah, is for you, is for your heart. I guess what I want to pause and say right at the beginning is that in all of the necessary kind of planning and organizing the detail and getting the sound system working right and all the things that it's taking to get this beautiful movement of God on the road, let's not lose sight that this is all because we are a part of, drawn into, woven into the greatest love story of all. We are here because of the love of God. It is the love of God for you and the love of God through you. There are all kinds of things we need to attend to to get it all done properly. And of course, of course, that's honoring and right. And, you know, but, but we're here because this is a love story. For God so loved the world, for God so loved the North Shore that he called you and his love for you and through you would, will make eternal change, eternal change. God's great love for you and through you. What does that actually look like? What does that actually look like? It's funny, actually, because sometimes I think when you talk about love, I, I feel sometimes these days someone wants to say very quickly, well, the truth in love, of course. You know, oh, hello, I didn't see you up there. Hello, well, there's people up here, I didn't realise. Hello, good morning, I'm so sorry. Did you pay more to get up there or less? <laughs> Well, you know, if you talk about, the, the, you know, love, oh, well, the truth in love, it's almost like love is somehow going to 
debase or dilute, you know, the risk. Oh, sorry, yes, that love is going to dilute truth. It's like, no, 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 no. Where did we get that notion from? Where did we get, for God so loved the world that he gave his son? Nothing could be further from the truth, that love, dil, 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 that love dilutes truth. The truth is God is love. And interwoven in this epic tale of hardship and grief and loyalty and crisis and romance that we find in Ruth are some extraordinary facets of God's great love for you. So I just want to draw those out this morning as we kind of, I know we, we, you've been kind of working at this for a while, but this today, Trinity Sunday, kind of marks the kind of a formal beginning of sorts, okay? So how does God love us on a day like this? Well, wonderfully, fully, extravagantly, lavishly. What does that look like? Well, first of all, it's a love for you that is supremely confident. It is a confident love. The love of God for you is confident. And you may think, well, of course God's love is confident because he is, of course, the creator of the universe. We just sang about that. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the I Am. And you would imagine that that would make him pretty confident. But in the book of Ruth, take a closer look at who God is placing his confidence in. This is a critical time in the history of the people of God. All seems lost. The kingdom is divided. There is Israel. There is Judah. There's a lot of bloodshed. There's a lot of political unrest. But in Ruth and Boaz's love begins the birth line of David. And to the house of David comes the long-awaited Messiah, Jesus Christ, is born. And so this portion of God's redemptive plan, um, this, that this portion of his plan should come together, God has placed his confidence in Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. Places confidence. And you can hear this confidence in Naomi's counsel to Ruth. She says, this is referring to Ruth and Boaz's potential marriage. Wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man, Boaz, will not rest until the matter is settled today. She's so confident in Boaz's love that she, she actually puts a time limit on it, and she's right. And then earlier in the story, Ruth places the same confidence upon Naomi when she says, I will do whatever you say. And Boaz is so confident that he even draws a crowd around him at the town gate to witness his kind of betrothal to Ruth. I recall uh, I had a, in the UK, in the Anglican church, if you're a curate, uh, you, you automatically, as a rite of passage, run the, the youth, you do the youth work. It's kind of what you do. Like, so I was a kind of, I did the youth work for a while and uh, had this great little youth group, awesome, some great kids passed through it. And there was one young man called, uh, called Tim and uh, he had this wonderful kind of reawakening in his faith. Um, it just was explosive, just wonderful. Um, and then he was going off to university uh, and I remember him kind of walking with me down the road past the church I remember exactly where we were, just outside the post office in Whitchurch. And I remember him pausing and saying, look, I'm just really concerned that I'm going to get to university and I'm just going to, I'm going to lose it. You know, my, my faith will evaporate. I, I, you know, have, I, have I got what it takes to kind of keep going with God or is it all going to come to nothing? And I remember looking at him and in that moment, the Lord was so kind because I felt this kind of inspiration in my heart, and I knew I was speaking for Jesus when I said to him, hey, Tim, it's not like that. You do know that Jesus trusts you with his love. You do know that he trusts you. And, and that, that touched him. It kind of touched his heart. And, and I remember getting a telephone call from him kind of halfway through his, his year, uh, first year, at, 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 and he, he'd been running an alpha course from his dormitory room, you know, from his and all these people have been coming, including, I'm going to do a name drop here, including Marcus Mumford from Mumford & Sons, you know, who came to faith through that alpha course. Yes, indeed. Anyway, that's why that was a bit of a name drop. Sorry, this just goes out. Somebody realized I just did a terrible name drop, but I think that's remarkable. Anyway, he, he called me. He called me and he said, um, Drew, I, I think um, I've been running this alpha course, and oh my gosh, I think I've started the church by accident. I mean, literally started the church by accident in his dorm room. And he's now actually ordained in the Anglican church. He's running a church in the east end of London somewhere, doing an awesome job. Um, but I think always, um, and I think it, it needs saying, especially at the beginning of this adventure that you're on, that 
you know, would it surprise you to know that God loves you so much that he trusts you in this adventure? He trusts you. I think you really need to hear that. So Father, Son, Holy Spirit, trust you in this beautiful adventure in faith. He really does. He is confident that his love through you will bear fruit. It is bearing fruit and it will go on bearing fruit. His word will not return to him undone. He trusts you with his love. So that's the first thing. It is a confident love. Jesus has every confidence in you in his love. The second thing about his love for you that we see through this wonderful celebration of love in the book of Ruth is that his love for you is tenacious, to say the least, actually. Tenacious. And in the story of Ruth, we see this tenacity, this redoubtable, resolute, persistent nature of God's love for you. What we're witnessing in the book of Ruth is this willful, willful determination on God's part that the house of Israel will be a light, not only to the Jewish people, but to the whole world. It is a well, a willful, determined, resolute, tenacious persistence in love. And just when you think it's all going to go up in smoke, God shows up and says, there we are. I told you it was all going to work out wonderfully. His love through Ruth, Boaz and Noah, Naomi conquers all. Guess who, um, if you want to think about the uh, tenacious nature of God's love, guess who Boaz had to thank for his good looks and godly character? Do you know who his mother was? Rahab. Rahab. Rahab, this poor woman who's caught up in a life of prostitution but shows incredible courage to the people of God when they're about to... Uh, and, and it's actually her word that gives them faith. It's actually her word that gives the people of God faith to, 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 to act on God's instructions in that moment. And Boaz and Ruth had a son named Obed who grew up to be the father of Jesse, who was the father to David, who, whose line begat Jacob, the father of Joseph, who was the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. That's tenacity. I mean, that's a fairly tenacious root, isn't it? The love of God is wildly, scandalously tenacious. It just does not stop. It doesn't give up. It doesn't return to him undone. Job was absolutely right. I know that you can do all things, Lord, and no plan of yours can be thwarted. Amen? Amen. I remember in the UK, we had this wonderful season of uh, kind of godly adventure with missional communities. And, and one of those communities was called um, The Way, because they, they had names and I won't go into all the details, but it was this wonderful group of people. And they were, it was an older group of people, actually. And they, they really wanted to bring God's love to their neighborhood, but they weren't sure how. Well, they, it was in the time when there was, a, I, I think it Kate was here as well, but do you remember when everyone was talking about the credit crunch? Do you remember that? There was a whole, there was a whole thing with finance. And, and so they thought, well, you know what? We'll, we'll run something about, you know, godly stewardship of money. So they, they kind of really went for it. And one person showed up to this event, which was very disappointing for them, except this one person was married to another member of the group who never ordinarily came to church and gave his life to the Lord while he was there. So they were kind of encouraged about that. That person then kind of directed them um, to this nursing home. And what they discovered was that on a Sunday evening, this nursing home, these elderly folk were kind of left with this awful British expression, which is a pleated dinner, which is, just means it's cold and horrible and cold and curled up at the edges and disgusting. And because the staff would kind of have an afternoon off, they probably needed that, but, you know, these old folk didn't get great care on a Sunday afternoon. So the person who'd come to faith kind of explained that, and these ladies said to themselves, well, you know what, we're, we're actually pretty good at uh, an English tea. You know, we can do that. You know, we, we, we bake a pretty mean Victoria sponge. So... So what we'll do is we will go in and we will look, we'll take care of these people. That we'll, we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll do tea. We'll do, you know, I say tea, I high tea for them on a, on a Sunday afternoon. So that's what they did. So that, and that, quite, that went really well. And then they learned that uh, 
some of these uh, ladies, the older ladies in, in this nursing home were having kind of 95-year-old birthdays. But at, by the time you get to 95, you're in a nursing home, a lot of their family had passed away or weren't there or they, and their friends had passed away. So they were kind of lonely, kind of birthday. So they thought, right, well, we can do better than that. We won't just do tea. We'll celebrate these ladies' birthdays. We'll, we'll throw the most epic 95-year-old birthday party week. So they did. They brought, brought, they brought balloons in. Everybody wrote a card. Not just one card, but lots of signatures. They all brought a card in and wrote. So this wonderful older lady had, you know, 30 cards to open on her birthday. They made a great big fuss of them. Wonderful. So that was going wonderfully, really. And then, and then within that, they started kind of offering prayer. And then had some small Bible studies kind of cropped up in this nursing home. Um, and then, and then the nursing home closed. It's like, oh, so what should we do now? Well, somebody had gathered through the nursing home that there were uh, a number of uh, homes in the area for people with physical disability. And what they learned was that there was a, a TV program called Songs of Praise in the UK. Um, and some of these folk had actually given their lives to Jesus through the TV program, which if you ever saw Songs of Praise would seem most unlikely, but there we are. <laughs> so... <laughs> But they couldn't actually get out on a Sunday evening um, to church. They couldn't because they, they weren't mobile. And there was, so basically this, this mission or community then started kind of, they gathered these folk. They kind of hired minivans. They worked it out. And they actually brought, they, they, they gathered these people who, who wanted, to, wanted to come together and worship. They physically kind of gathered them. And they ended up um, throwing, they discovered that this group had a real passion for, for rock and roll. So they threw rock and roll parties after church for these people. It was the most, and I, I just, why am I telling you all of this? Because I think I look at that, I remember that, and this is one example. I mean, there's another, another missional community that ended up buying a double-decker bus and running all kinds of things in their neighborhood. I mean, but it's, it's tenacity. Do, do you hear what I'm saying here? They was tenacious. They didn't give up. They just kept looking, okay, well, where next? Where next? Where next? God's love is this creative, determined, resolute, steadfast love. Um, and he desires to tenaciously pour that through us. And I guess, I, I'm telling you all about this group in the UK and so forth, because I, I guess my question is, what would it look like to be tenacious with God's love along the North Shore? What would, what would it look like for God's, the tenacity of God's love to pour through you to those who who don't yet know him. Because I think he's given you this, I know he's given you this wonderful blank page to write his love story for the North Shore here. And I wonder what he's going to write through you. I'm so eager to see that. I hope I can show up and be part of it on occasion. You might invite me if you want. You know, will we bring some kind of sanctified imagination to this endeavor? You know, um, this, this wonderful blank canvas upon which to paint his love. Because I know that in all, of, in all of that tenacity, it brought that group incredible joy to do that, which is my last point. God's love for you and over you is joyful. It is joyful. The book of Ruth is a grand love story that is distinguished by joy. And chapter four, absolutely, that's a great big moment of celebration. If we were watching this as a movie, this would be the moment where we'd all stand up in the cinema. In fact, if we go to the cinema, we can go to the movie house now, we would. We'd stand up and we'd cheer. We'd throw off our masks and say, hurrah. Maybe. (laughs) But the whole story of Ruth, actually, joy is kind of drizzled through the whole thing. There are these wonderful moments, these little conversations as the kindness and the gleaning in the field and then the covering of the feet and all kinds of other lovely conversations that go on. Joy is kind of drizzled through this whole thing to which you might be tempted to say, well, jolly well done, Naomi, uh, Boaz and Ruth. Good for them. Good for you and all your joy. But actually, my life at the moment doesn't feel very much like a Cary Grant movie, so shut up. You know, you could think that. (laughs) Well, the thing is, in Jesus, we are drawn into the greatest love story as both as both an object and a protagonist in his love, if you like. Jesus is and always will be our kinsman redeemer. He is the one who has, almost at the last moment, really, I guess in one sense, leaned in and rescued us and restored us and redeemed him. 
In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he has lavished on us, Ephesians 1.7. A lavish love that we can be confident of. A, a love so lavish that it tenaciously chases us down. Day after day after day. Moment after moment. And such a lavish love is intended to bring us joy. It's intended to bring us joy. You, The psalmist says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is the fullness of joy. Joy at your right hand are pleasures evermore. Joy, 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 joy. And I wonder how often we might miss this gift of joy. Let me put it this way to you. Eleanor, who's with me here this morning, um, loves tapas meals. You know, tapas in Spanish food. All these little plates. And I like it too. You know, and all the plates come, except... Except that for me, I'm kind of waiting for the main course. And so the, kind of the food comes and I'm thinking, well, I'm not going to eat all of those delicious little potato things because, you know, there may be some meat coming later and I don't want to, you know, spoil my appetite. So, you know, I let, I let it pass. And, I'm, and it's, for me, it's an odd experience because I'm constantly waiting for the main course. I'm constantly waiting for the main course. Uh, and I think sometimes in life, we... We, 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 miss, we miss the main course of life because we think um, that the joy of God comes at the main course. When the point that I'm making, I'm really making a mess of this, which is a shame because I actually think there's something profound here that I just messed up on. But you can make you joy that I'm messing up a story. But the point is this. The point is this. We kind of live waiting for the main course, but Jesus, is, every season of your life is a main course with Jesus. There isn't a moment where it's like, okay, we'll just get through this and then the joy will come. It's like, no. And he plays, what's so wonderful about the Lord is he places joy in the, in the ordinary moments, almost for us to find. And so I guess for you, as you set out on this adventure, I think it would be a mistake if you thought, oh, well, you know, as soon as we're really sure about where we're going to meet or where we got a building or where we go, then we can have joy. Or, well, you know, when we get to this point, a year from now, when the, now, no, 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 no. Take the joy now. Find the joy in the, in the, in the ordinary moments. Do, do you not often find that, that there are these kind of big epic moments that you look forward to and, and afterwards you're like, yeah, that was great, that was great. But actually, where something really struck your heart was something where you perhaps even weren't even expecting it. It was incredibly ordinary, but it just kind of lit you up. And I think that's the kind of joy that the Lord kind of drizzles through in his love for us to find and to experience and to know. And I wonder, as these wretched masks come off, you know, whether we're going to find, I pray that we find that again in the ordinary. You know, the other, the other, the other evening, we, um, I mean, it's such a shame that the summer's over, isn't it? What a shame. But last week in the summer, <laughs> um, we, um, I said, oh, let's, we're heading in. I said, let's go for an ice cream because the sun was still shining and it was warm. And so we went for an ice cream and it was, it was lovely. And, and you're going to, I'm going to tell you this story and you're like, Bishop, you need to get out more, which is true, probably. But anyway, we ended up on the way back. You know, I have, I have many daughters, and suddenly it was kind of like, oh, we need to go to CVS. And there was this great joy in the car, because CVS in Newburyport is open 24-7. I didn't know that. Dangerous if you have daughters, I tell you. But anyway, so we ended up, we ended up in CVS, and honestly, it would have been cheaper to take them all out for dinner, quite frankly. I mean, it was... But my point is this. I, I'm sharing this because it's, it's silly, but I, I offer it because I look back on that week and actually kind of mooching around CVS on a Wednesday evening after an ice cream was, was actually really enjoyable. And maybe it was because it was a school night and generally you wait for ice cream for the, the, you know, for the weekend or probably it was because you're with the people that you love. But there's joy to be found, you know, in the ordinary. And I think, I think, we, I think it's, a ter it's a terrible thing that British people do, this delayed gratification, you know? Every, every season of your life is the main course with Jesus. Every season. There is joy to be found. Uh, it's, it's not that silly moment where he's like, oh, you know. If... There, there is pain, of course. There is pain. I'm not. But, but he, he has this wonderful way of just 
bring joy into, into the ordinary, that we would know that even in the moments of pain, we are held and we are loved and he has us secure. Don't miss the joy to be found in, the, in every moment of this adventure. Don't miss that. Jesus loves to locate joy in the ordinary. Finally this, finally this. Cut my nails, cut my nails. I've just, I've just tried to talk into my hand as a microphone. I can, cut my nails, I can't. So um, let, me just, let me just offer you this, because the Lord really kind of called me to think on this this week. Uh, Isabel, my... Uh, She's not the, I never, I never say, like to say middle because it sounds wrong, but she's not the youngest, she's not the eldest, she's in the middle. But Isabel returned uh, from Virginia. She's at college at William & Mary, 700 mile trip, which is a long way. Um, and she, she arrived and she said, Dad, the oil warning light is, is, is going. So uh, I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll take your car tomorrow and I'll, I'll, I'll fix that for you. So I took the car off and I, I put it through a car wash and I filled it with gas and, uh, and I went into the, the garage, the little store, and I actually chose the most expensive oil I could find because I had an echo of my father in back of my business. Don't go cheap on oil, son. You know, put decent oil in your car, son. I could hear my dad. So I, I picked the most expensive little thing of oil. Could I find the way to open the bonnet? No, I couldn't. It got embarrassing. I was there for ages, and I thought people are watching. There's video cameras going. I'm going to asleep. So we finally got home. I said to Isabel, where is the thing in your Volvo to open the hood? And so she showed me. And it's, by now it's getting dark. So I said, OK, so where's your oil cap? And she, she pointed to the dipstick. She'll kill me for telling you this, but I think she'd been applying oil via the dipstick thing. You know, the little, I was like, no, 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 no. And I think I was, I said, oh, your dipstick, you know, so, dad. Anyway, so, so I put the oil in, and I was a little cocky at this point, so I'm kind of putting the oil in. I said, look, it goes here, you know, put it in. Anyway, by then the lights are coming on, and oh, well, it's, I, I'm walking back into the kitchen out of the darkness, and I can, I can, I can see the bottle, um, and I realize that I'm actually holding in my hand an empty plastic bottle of transmission fluid. I know. I know, I know that was my reaction. I almost cried, actually, quite frankly. I couldn't sleep. I thought I have ruined my daughter's car. Like she, I was so upset about this, you know. <laughs> um, so you know, Eleanor was great. She says, "All right, we can fix it." And Isabel was incredibly laid back. She said, "Oh, Dad, you know, you'll sort it out." I'm like, oh my God, so I have to buy her a new car. We went to CVS on Wednesday. It's only Thursday. I have to buy her a new car. <laughs> So I, I went to the garage the next day, and, and actually, if you want to know, this is a really ridiculous, ridiculous practical detail, but if you, if, I put, if you put oil in the transmission thing, you're, <laughs> yeah, that's bad. <laughs> this was probably the better kind of mistake to have made, so I could drive it to the garage, and they were great, they drained it, and blah, 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 blah. But I was kind of reading around it, um, and basically, I, you know, I, I, I found myself kind of praying about this. Um, and the thing is, transmission oil doesn't contain the combustible elements that are gonna, that will ignite the engine. I'm talking like I know what I'm talking about. This is like off Google, right? Doesn't contain the combustible end of the parts that you need. Um, you know, what, 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 we, what we need to pour into the engine is, is combustible oil. And I guess for us, as we begin this adventure, you know, it's like, don't try this at home on your own. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot be Trinity without the power of the Holy Spirit. You absolutely need the fullness of God's love in the power of his spirit to move forward. He's not expecting you to do this on your own. He's like, don't try this on your own. Do this in the power of my love. And I, I kind of was poking around the Bible because um, I was interested in this, this idea of the oil of the spirit. And actually, of course, Isaiah 61 verse 3, instead of ashes, the oil of joy. That's what we need. That's what we need. The oil of joy. Instead of mourning, a garment of praise. Instead of a spirit of despair. We need, we need to let him pour his love through us and ignite that, that joy in our hearts. 
that we can behold him and know him and encounter him and share him. Not because we feel we ought to, but because we just can't but help it. You know, what would it look like for us to be just so filled with God's love that we cannot but resist in joy, but to give it away? And so what would happen if we, if we filled up on the, the, the oil of God's spirit, if the joy of the Lord really infused our hearts? I can tell you, because it says in Isaiah 61, it says, well, if they did that, they will be called oaks of righteousness. They will be a planting of the Lord for the, for the display of his splendor. That's what you have before you. Let it be joy unto you. Know that God is supremely confident that his love working through you will and is bearing fruit, even now. And it is a love that is tenacious. Let him be tenacious through your heart. Know that he is lavish in his love. And know the joy in it. Know the joy in it. Not next week, not six months later. Now, today, even if it's raining on Memorial Weekend, they'll show you the joy in it. They'll show you the joy in it. Let 